Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Adam Rosine. I work for a tiny company called Inner Product. And uh, it's, uh, we are sort of a sister company of Underscore, who's in the UK. We are in the US. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me and voting for the talk. Um, did we vote? Yeah, we voted. Um, so today, uh, this talk sort of started out with um, some, some, some musings by my, my business partner, Noel Welsh. And we sort of tried to um, systematize it, how we teach. Um, and how we, because we teach and mentor people learning functional programming in Scala, along with sort of other project work. Um, I wanted to share sort of what we've learned so far. Um, so the title talk about, of the talk is about systematic software. Can, what does systematic mean? Like, we all learn programming. I'm, I'm guessing, I'm not quite sure, that you know, most people sort of learn on their own. Sort of, sort of the, this uh, typical path of, oh, you're supposed to learn it by yourself, and, or I don't know. Like, it happens that way. And it's not cool. Like, we're a community. We can help each other. We can have good training materials. We can have, we can, you know, there's chat rooms. We've all been helped out on whatever version of IRC we're on, Slack, et cetera. Uh, so then I'm going to go through sort of a demonstration. Well, how, how would I use these strategies? Um, and, and I'll just try that. I'm going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to have these strategies? How does it, what, what do we, um, how should we think about them in terms of what we already know? Uh, in how we approach programming. Uh, then I'm going to sort of finish up by listing our strategies that we've come up with so far. I don't think anything will be terribly new, but we're trying to give names to these things so we can reuse them. Uh, and then I'll finish up. Okay, 30 minutes. This is fast. All right. Everybody ready? Okay. All right. Uh, systematic. So um, this is kind of how we teach programming. It's like, it's like the joke about the owl, or I found this one to be funnier. You know, how do you draw an owl? How do you draw a doge? Well, you draw some circles, and then you draw the rest of the bleep uh, in dog. And that's kind of, it, it's sort of our, our structure of learning in, in programming is a lot like this. Like, oh, here's how you uh, create a trait in Scala, and then this is how you do monad transformers. Or, you know, it's sort of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, I need a little bit, uh, I need to slow it down, I, I, need, to, uh, I need a little help. Um, we have Stack Overflow. There's all these ways that we sort of compensate. Um, um, so this is a little bit of a better picture. Um, it kind of breaks down the steps that we need to do to draw this stupid owl. Um, you know, there's sort of an, there's an ordering we could take. Maybe, maybe we start with the feet first because we really like feet. But you know, we can kind of move around. We can follow the sequence. We can, we, can, um, we can dance a little bit. We can change the order. We can do things a little bit differently in our, our own way. But we have, the, we have the building blocks. And so if you think about programming, um, we, have, we have the building blocks. We have little pieces of knowledge. And we connect them together in our head. And that's part of the learning process. But maybe we can make things more explicit. Um, so if you're going to have a systematic process to programming, we're still going to use our brains. It's still going to be a creative endeavor, but maybe we can sort of reduce the effort. So uh, we need this process to be consistent. So if, if we apply some strategy and the world becomes, the world should become clearer rather than, you know, we should always sort of, it's sort of like um, deterministic. It has to be referentially transparent. If we put something in, we should get, sort of get the same thing out every time. Uh, it has to be scalable. So uh, I need all of you to apply these strategies when you get back to work. So please do that. Um, you know, it's got to work. So we have to be able to teach them. It has to be sort of low, not, not low effort, but enough effort so it really sinks in. It has to be valuable so it can scale out and we can, we can just sort of pass it along. We all learned from our peers. I had so many great um, people that I work with that I learned stuff. Ross is right there. Where's my hat, Ross? I'm your stunt double. Um, so, you know, we got it. Th this is the way it spreads out. Uh, it needs to save time. You know, why, if we're just going to create some waterfall process that's going to take up time, that isn't what we're doing, it's got to be easy to use. 
So what if, what if Scala, using Scala and, and functional programming can be like this? I think we already have drank the Kool-Aid. We already believe in Scala and functional programming and all these really cool things that we love learning about. Um, how can we make this a little bit more systematic so we can spend less time with kind of the, the stuff we have to do and move more into the t the, where we really want to be? Um, we need consistent code, readable code. So if we have this process that's more systematic, it's sort of like uh, not everyone is formatting their code this differently anymore. We're all using the stupid Scala format plugin, which sort of maxim, you know, it sort of removes that argument. Um, so if we have some common processes, then uh, things can flow a bit more smoothly. Uh, we can make newer engineers, newer developers, newer programmers uh, more efficient. They don't have to bang their heads against the walls that we have banged our heads against. Ouch. Uh, and also we can separate things that maybe are a little bit mixed in our own brains. So we're programming. We have, to, we have our JIRA ticket or whatever. We have this thing that we need to do. How do I, in the end it's going to get translated into code, but there's a huge amount of thinking that goes on between reading what we want to do or talking about it and getting that thing shipped out. So if we can perhaps um, have these steps which move us along, it, it can follow the sort of natural boundaries in our programs and what we want to write. So we're going to use programming strategies. This is what this talk is about. There's, a whole, there's probably a whole bunch of stuff about how to organize teams and interactions, but this is going to be about programming strategies. All right. So in the abstract, it said I would live code. I don't think there's enough time because I'm going to hit backspace all the time and go, Ooh, uh, uh, uh. so I canned it. I apologize. Um, but I'm going to try and show you sort of uh, what these things mean. So I'm going to demonstrate five different strategies. So we're going to build, uh, in honor of uh, Mike Pilquist, you know, so we're going to, we're going to build a, we're going to design a stream processing system. So like FS2, like Monix. Um, how would we do that? Okay, if I said, you, you team, go build a stream processing system. Be like, uh, what is that? What are we going to do? Like, it's, it's sort of a big thing. So we need to break down the problem. So what is a stream? Hmm, we gotta, this, is, this, is, this is the hardest part because we have to go, OK, well, where do I start? Um, so I don't know. I'm going to go look somewhere else. Someone else probably saw this problem. We know people. Um, and I can get some ideas. So I go out there, I read blog posts, I type that into Google. It's fine. That's, that's what it's there for. There's papers about it if you want to go deep into the semantics of blah, 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 blah. Um, that's what we do. This is where we start. Has someone done this before? What can, I, what can I take with us? There's a huge amount of stuff. All these things. We have in, in Scala, we have a lot of resources. Yes, let's use that. So what can we, uh, what can we, what can we do? Well. Let's just make it easier. Let's say, OK, I have a stream of data. So, so a stream of data, there's stuff coming in. I'm going to do something to it. Stuff is going out. This kinda, it's kind of like the data is, is laid out like a list. There's, there's data, uh, but, but it's, it's not necessarily data in, you know, if, if data's in a list, it's all there. It's in, it's, it's in, the, it's in space. But streams, like there's data that isn't here yet, and there's data that's already passed through, so it's more like the data's in time. So maybe we can get some inspiration. Maybe we can steal some stuff from just like list, and then we can build a stream off of that. All right, let's do that. Let's, let's totally steal that stuff. Um, so streams like a list. So yes, as Picasso said, great artists steal. Totally steal. We're, you know, we call it stealing, open source, free software. You know, they're close. Um, all right, I bumped up the contrast, good. So I'm going to steal a very small subset of the API of list. Uh, and I'm just going to slap it into my, boom, there we go, copy paste. Or I just type it up. So a stream, a stream is a, is, has some data that's streaming by, it's of type A. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with my stream, so maybe I can map it. 
Maybe I can zip it with another stream to put things side by side. I can flat map it and be very happy I'm a cool monad. Um, I, can, I can run it. This is going to be different. That's not in, that's not in list. We're, we're going to need this. Um, but I need a way to create a, a stream. So I don't know. I'll just, if someone gives me an iterator, it's Java, we're on the JVM. Someone gives me an iterator, I can sort of wrap that up and make it look like a stream. So I can, I can produce a stream, I can do maps and, and zips and flat maps and, and sort of program it. I can get some strings in and produce integers out or whatever my flow is. Um, but then eventually, since this is a, a system that's moving data in time, I need to run it. So, so here we go. We're just going to start here. Um, these might be some, some places you might start. We're stealing some methods from something that we already know. OK, I sort of know how map works. I, I get some A, and I run the function f, and it turns A into a B. And then I have a B, and then I send it along its way. But I don't implement it. I don't know how to do this yet. So there's triple question marks, one of my very favorite methods. It exists. A lot of people don't, don't know, but yeah, it, you can, there's this triple question mark. It allows you to make code that compiles but does not run. Usually we like things to not compile first, but if you just want to like, it's a, good, it's a good stepping stone. Okay, I got it to compile, even though it doesn't run, but that's okay. So sort of as an aside, many APIs have a similar structure in the sense that they get called algebraic. So, so algebraic is a fancy word, um, but it basically means that there's ways to get into the system. So like I can, in this example, I turn an iterator into a stream. Stream is the system I'm working with. I can go into it, so now I'm in the world of streams. There's sort of combinators which transform streams into other streams. So I, li I go into the stream world. I, li I do some changes in my stream world. And then, and then there's a way to get out. Those are usually called elimination forms. So, OK, I've, I've transformed my stream. How do I actually do something? And that's sort of what our run method is. And then they have laws which sort of govern how they're supposed to use. So you might see that, that phrase in sort of, uh, and this structure repeat itself a lot. So how do we implement those triple question marks? I don't know. That seems really hard. Well, um, one thing we could do is this fancy word. It's called reification. It means I don't know what to do. I'm going to make it someone else's problem. Ha ha. So really what reification means is uh, I'm going to take this method call like map, and I'm just going to create a data structure that says, well, I'm going to do the map later. And the way I can, I can make this work is a uh, map is going to be a kind of, of stream. So I have case class map. It extends stream. I sort of save my, my this pointer. I save the function I'm going to run. And I just create, I just like, OK, somebody calls map. I'm just going to save that function and put it in this data structure. So this is called reification. We're turning code into data because we don't know how to do it yet. So I'm just going to save what I'm going to do. And, and we'll worry about it later, you know, a few slides down. And so we can, uh, we can do this for all of our, almost all of our methods. I can, I can reify map, I can reify zip, I can reify flat map. Be like, I don't know how to do these yet. I'm just going to create this sort of syntax tree, this program that says what I want to do. I still don't know how to do run. If I, if I reified run and created a new case class run, well, Run doesn't produce a stream. Run produces some value of type B from my stream of type stream of A. Map takes a stream into another stream, so it's OK to return this, this subtype of stream. So I've, I've successfully avoided work. This is great. I turn my code into data. So how do we run it? That's, that's the missing piece now. Like, OK, I've, I've done everything. All those methods have implementations except run. How do I run it? How do I, if I have a stream of A's, there's A's coming in and I have to send something out, how do I, how do I get that value out of the stream? Well, it, this is really like an interpreter. I've, I've saved the program via this reification fancy word. I've turned my code into data. 
And now I have to run it. Run it. Oh, I'm gonna, it's an interpreter, right. I have, I have what I want to do, and now I actually have to do it. So, okay, that's, that's just our, our software and computer science term for running the thing. I write an interpreter. That's what I do. Now we have a name for it. And so one of the, sort of under the interpreter umbrella, uh, we can use structural recursion to implement it. How do I write an interpreter? If I said, hey, please write an interpreter for this abstract syntax tree, that's a little bit intimidating. That's a little bit difficult. I don't know, where do I start? Well, um, with structural recursion, so what is structural recursion? Another sort of term of the art. Um, we have this algebraic data type. We have our stream. A stream is either a, uh, we created a stream from an iterator. It was this map reification. It was a flat map reification. It was a zip. So if we, um, if we have a stream, we can pattern match on it. There's only so many types of subtypes of stream. We can just pattern match on it. So how do I, there's a bit of a indirection with this loop thing. So uh, don't worry about that too much. The real essence of an interpreter, when we have an algebraic data type, when we have this sealed trait, where we know all the possibilities for all the cases, we just pattern match. So that's, that's what structural recursion is, is, is the name of. We pattern match. Okay, what am I doing? Well, I just, I just expand it. These are all the choices. How do I run? Well, if I'm mapping, I do this. If I'm zipping, I do this. If I'm flat mapping, I do this. It's completely, I don't have to think too much. The code just kind of, I know what to do outside of this other part. So, we, we had run equals question mark, question mark, question mark. We applied structural recursion. We said, okay, well, it's got, these are the cases. I'm gonna expand my cases, and now I have some new question marks. So we're gonna take care of those now. Ah, it's semi-easy. So how do we do that? Um, so we can just sort of, uh, another strategy we, we use is sort of, we call it follow the types. So by follow the types, it means, okay, well, um, Somebody's calling the run method, and I'm a stream of, in this loop method, I, I, I have a C, and I'm supposed to return something of type B. So we kind of play a process of elimination game. Okay, I have, a, I have a C, and I'm supposed to produce something of type B. So maybe that sort of restricts the problem space, and, and I can just sort of wire the things I have available together uh, instead of trying to wait for divine inspiration. Um, so here's an implementation of map. So what is map supposed to return? Map is supposed to return, um, it takes a stream, in this case of type stream of C's, and a, a map is gonna return another stream of some other type. So I'm gonna transform my C into something else. So if we do a bit of process of elimination, I, I won't bore with you, there's kind of only one way to do it. Um, that's really great. We don't have a huge swath of possibilities. There's sort of, I can only access uh, value zero, I can only call f, I can only use the parameters of my uh, destructured map, I can use that s and that f2. Those are the things I can use. Maybe by combining them, I can produce the right output type. That's what we mean by follow the types. So you go through the exercise, you bang your head. This is not easy. This is where we, we're thinking, but we, we line everything up and the compiler says, yes, that's it. And we run it and look, we mapped a, a stream. This is amazing. Um, so I create uh, a stream, one, two, three. That's, what, that's how we started. Maybe we make some other ones later. We map and, and then I run it and I sort of collect all the output, so I start with an empty list, and then as I get more elements, I append it to that list, and then I get list two, three, four. It was amazing, I loved it. I loved programming. Ah, that was good. Yes, it's canned, but it's sort of an idealization. So what, what do you think? You want some of that? You put it in a can, that'd be great. So, um, so that was a demonstration of sort of the idea that we're trying to get across, that we have these strategies, um, and we can kind of semi-systematically apply them as we go. A lot of it is deal with it later, but deal with it later in a very structured way. Um, 
So kind of briefly, I wanted to talk about, well, how does this fit into the context of learning, of teaching, how we learn how to program, uh, how we teach other people how to program? Um, so just kind of briefly, um, I think if we look at out there in the ecosystem and how we learn and how languages are taught and approached, sometimes they're very, um, they're very language oriented. So these are the keywords, this is the syntax, this is how you make a class, this is how you override things, this is what the sealed keyword means, um, this is implicit. Whew, that's a lot. Um, and they're very sort of, uh, I guess, Noel, Noel calls it like Scala is like the assembly language of, uh, of, of functional programming. Like we have these constructs, we have this, mach this language that's sort of like these, these primitives that allow us to create these very powerful abstractions. But it's, it's, they're, they're not how we're thinking about the problem. Are we thinking about the problem? We're thinking about, OK, uh, a, a stream, or I'm writing an image processing library, and I'm talking about an image, and I'm skewing the image, and I'm, I'm transforming it, and, and, and uh, zooming in, and rotating, and, and layering. We're thinking conceptually. We're thinking about the meaning of these things. What does it mean to? Um, receive an order on my Kafka thing, and what does it mean, what kind of state am I writing, and what message do I need to send downstream? We're not thinking, our job is to translate those, those concepts uh, into code, but there's kind of a big barrier between what we're, we're thinking about, the meaning of it, and how to do it. So, so sometimes these, these are um, contrasted with the terms operational. So uh, an operational semantic would be like, this is how, when I, when I write this code, this is what happens on the machine. You can view it in terms of, uh, for programming, like, okay, um, what do I have to type to, to do what, to have the computer do what I want it to do? This is translation between your brain and what you have to tell the compiler. Um, it's sort of machine-oriented, language-oriented, syntax-oriented a bit, maybe. Um, we want to contrast, we, we sort of want to maybe coin a new term, like is a de instead of an operational strategy, oh, here's how you create a class, here's how you do this or that in the language. We kind of want to pull back a little bit and, and, and we call it a, a denotational strategy. So a denotation is more about the meaning of a, of a term. So um, what am I doing? What does it mean to uh, map over a stream? What, uh, you know, it transforms a stream of A's into a stream of B's. Uh, I can't, if I'm only turning A's into B's, I can't make this, any inputs I can't, I can't like duplicate them, I can't, I can't drop things. Every A turns into a B, so that's sort of the meaning of it. Um, we want to think, and it's a little bit closer to how I think, our, and we think, our, our brains work when we're programming. We're, we're thinking up here, we're not, and, and sort of our skill, is how sort of fluid it is to translate those ideas into code. So we kind of want to accelerate that process, make it a bit more systematic. There's my, there's the end of the academic side of that thing. So uh, I just want to finish up with uh, sort of our current list of strategies, um, kind of show what they're about. Uh, we want to give names to these things so I can, so when we're working together, you know, we're pair programming because pair programming is great. We're mob programming, I don't know. We can say, oh, this is what you do. We're going to use the interpreter pattern. Oh, that's a great idea. I know how to do that. Do, 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 do. Oh, well, we have an algebraic data type. Oh, da, 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 da. And we're going to structure. It's going to be less, less friction. So the first thing we always do is uh, we read the literature. We live in a community. There's all this research that we can learn from. There's cutting edge research. There's foundational research. There's meta research. There's stack overflow. There's our channels that we talk on all the time. Other people have thought about this before. We can leverage them. We can file the types. We have this great compiler. We have types. We can learn all about these fancy types. They help us. They help us describe what we want. And what's, what, what's really great about them is we can use our triple question mark language feature. We can say, I don't know how to do this, but this is what it has to do. It has to take these inputs and produce this kind of output. And I can just start there. I can fill in those question marks later. So I can see, and then I can see how they plug into to each other. 
oh, this output can be an input to this one. I can see how my program flows. I can work at that level before I work on an implementation. It's really tempting to jump into that implementation, but we can, we can gain a few benefits by, by avoiding that um, at a certain stage. We have algebraic data types. So these are like ands and ors. So a, a user is either a logged out user or a logged in user. And ands are just like uh, our products. So they are case classes in, in Scala. We have an automatic translation between this modeling of ands and ors. The ors we can make into a sealed trait hierarchy. So there's only two cases here. A shape is a circle or a rectangle. And then a circle is a radius, and a, a rectangle is a height and a, a, a width. So if someone gives us a shape, we know it's one of those two choices. And once we know which choice it is, we know how to destructure it into its fields. Completely mechanical. If we have an algebraic data type, we can then transform it into anything else that we want. The code will always look the same. We pattern match. We see which case we're in. We destructure it. We produce some values. The cases are separated. We can apply this over and over again. If we don't, in contrast, if we don't make an algebraic data type, we can't know all the possibilities. We can't do this. So if we restrict ourselves a little bit in how we model, we get this other thing for free. Sequencing, this is like doing one thing before or after the other, or maybe at, this, at the same time, in quotes. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't show an example of that, but we use it all the time, a four comprehension. These are sort of our applicative and monadic effects. Uh, this is how we represent it in the language, but it's something that we can control. We can say when we're designing, oh, well, do I need ordering here? Do I need some notion of data dependency? Or are these things independent? And that automatically can map to, say, an applicative or a monad. Oops. Interpreters, they're a big subject. There's so much to learn, but they're really about separating what from how. If you make that choice in your, in your system, you can really focus on one or the other, and they don't have to be mingled and, and confusing in your brain. Uh, there's sort of two general strategies inside of uh, the world of interpreters. One is this reification idea. It says, well, I don't know how to implement this function, so I'm just going to make some data that represents what I'm supposed to do. And it's someone else's job to uh, run it later. Uh, sort of the opposite direction is, is, is uh, we term church encoding. So I have some data, and I want to turn it into a function. So it's sort of the, the opposite process. There's, there's sort of trade-offs with uh, one or the other. Similarly, like, so if you had a, uh, for, for those in a more advanced setting, there might be like a free monad, which is like a static representation, a semi-static representation versus a, t a finely tagless uh, representation, which is all uh, functionalized, all encoded this way. Uh, the one of the final strategies is type classes. So many languages don't have type classes. We have type classes. They're used all over in our libraries. They're powerful for sort of doing this ad hoc polymorphism. Happy to talk about that as much after this as much as possible. So to, to sort of briefly summarize, we have these strategies. I think we all do some or all of them. Uh, our goal is really to give them names so we can use them as a vocabulary in our, when we interact, when we program together, when we build things. Uh, and I really hope that some of those strategies ring a bell for you and, and you might you might start to use them. So I uh, thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple questions. Thanks, Rob. Hi, sorry, this is sort of an easy question. Um, are you guys are, are you guys going to develop a course or, or write a book or a pamphlet or or something? I, I think this, well, is, a, this is a great them, idea uh, to be able to point to these things. Yes, I think that's a great idea. I'm thinking along the same lines. Um, we use them sort of informally in our training, um, so we teach them along with sort of learning about algebraic data types and learning about Scala the language. Um, our training follows sort of a similar flow as sort of our, um, the demonstration I had. 
Um, but yes, there should. I would like to have a repository of these these patterns, sort of sort of like in the in the old days with the um, design patterns, and um, these are oriented towards functional programming. Um, let's do it. Um, I, the the idea of using strategies and and naming the str different strategies is uh, sounds like it'd be a powerful teaching tool. I'm looking at teaching a totally different language that is not functional at all, and so I'm wondering, how did you discover these strategies? Like, how did you decide this is the okay? This is a distinct strategy. This is a strategy set I can use to implant this into other people's brains. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so my partner, Noel, he, he, um, a lot of it comes from how to design programs from the Racket community, um, Dr. Racket and such. They have, it's a great, it's a great book. A lot of these strategies are lifted directly from them. Uh, that being said, th that's a, it's a very functional language. Um, how did we do it? Um, there... I don't want to take, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, yeah, it, it just takes a lot of reflection and talk and be like, okay, what, what are we doing here? Like, what are these, if you, if you, if you, one way to do it would be to, uh, if, if you are the expert or someone else is sort of the expert who knows how to do these, they may not sort of consciously know what they're doing when they're programming. The, the idea would be to try and get them to talk, to try and like describe their process. Oh, this is what I'm doing. And then why are you doing that? What is it giving, what, do you, what are you giving up? What are you, what are you gaining by that practice? Um, uh, a lot of pair programming, a lot of sort of peer, peer learning, sort of explaining the reasoning behind things. That, that's sort of how we've done it. Um, and then repetition really w was, was probably um, one of the biggest drivers. We kept on seeing the same patterns over and over ago over and over again in our, in, in our training, in our mentoring programs where we, we work one-on-one. -on -one. Um, oh, the, everybody keeps running up against this problem. They, and like, well, they seem to be focusing on the language, not really sort of what they're trying to do. And, um, and yes, we have to get over the, the, the warts of our language. Scala isn't perfect and every language has its difficulties. But if we can, if we can find those things that make it a little bit smoother, a little bit less friction. Um, what do I need to know to get over this hump? Uh, then, then, you know, right up, we, we take notes when we're, when, we're, when we're helping people, when we're working with teams, and uh, you sort of, every once in a while, you step back, oh, these problems, they're, uh, they were solved. What did they do? It, it's a lot of uh, reflective sort of activities, I would say. There's also a lot of a academic research about what works and doesn't work, mostly about what doesn't work in programming. Uh, it's easy to sort of say something doesn't work. It's hard to say that something actually does work. Um, Greg Wilson has a really good book about what works in software. Um, that might be some inspiration in sort of a, a language agnostic um, setting. Awesome. Thank you very much, Adam.